Everybody, good evening. There we go. Let's start with a prayer and then we are going to jump into the next uh, part of Dedicate. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for this day and for the beautiful breeze. Thank you for the gift of life. And creation that sometimes is not acknowledged. They're the simple things like wind and water, ocean. Uh, we thank the Lord for these beautiful created things, and especially for our souls that are the uh, most important thing that was created uh, in our world for us, our souls that are eternal. We pray, Lord, that tonight will move us to uh, love you, especially in the sacraments of baptism and Holy Eucharist, to appreciate these two great sacraments more and to live out our call to be missionary disciples. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have a quick ad announcement from Don. Make this very quick. I don't want to be between you and the dedicate. Uh, uh, in last week's bulletin, as well as the uh, coming week's bulletin, I'll give you a little peek for that. Uh, there's been a column by uh, Father John regarding you asking two questions. Are you interested in becoming Catholic? And if you are already Catholic, would you like to be confirmed? I probably doesn't apply to most everyone in this room, but think about your friends, your family members, your co-workers uh, who might like to share this information with. This is, of course, about our Christian initiation of adults. Uh, program uh, that will be coming up in a few weeks. Uh, last thing in both last week's bulletin as well as the coming week's bulletin, most of the articles have been about a reflection uh, from students from last year as well as sponsors from last year. It's been some delightful reflections. If you have uh, if you haven't had a chance to see some of those, I have some copies of uh, both uh, next week's as well as this week's bulletin here with me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, John. All right, so we are, remember we are, we have just finished up uh, chapter eight. We're moving into actually chapter nine and 10 for tonight. If, does anybody need a um, Didache? Okay, because we do have some extras here. Anybody else? Okay. Someone maybe back, if you don't mind. Put your hand up and there we go. What do we call it? That's Greek, right? Okay. Not didache. It's called? All right. Good, 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 good. You're never going to forget this. You're going to dream about it. Uh, by the way, uh, some folks have asked for a holy card of my mom if you're interested. I have uh, one set that have her picture, one set that has a traditional um, Christ or, or the Virgin. So if you would like... Please, um, and keep her in your prayers. Wow. <laughs> okay. So um, kind of an interesting thing from last time you remember, both baptizer and baptize are to bask. Okay, this is what was the common experience of the early church. By the way, when someone was going to be baptized, what develops in the early church is a baptismal area, correct? And so usually it's stepping down three times, three steps in and then three steps out after you're baptized. That is because of the Holy Trinity. Okay, there's so already there's heavy symbolism that's coming into what we do 
um, in sacraments. And when you step into the water, the font, what develops is you will look up. And when you look up to the ceiling over the baptismal font, it will display martyrdom. Okay, so followers of Christ being martyred. And the whole idea was you're entering into baptism, which is a death with Christ. And you must understand that being a follower of Christ may exact the most dramatic response from you. Martyrdom. Okay. In fact, that would happen in a short time. We know there are great persecutions that happen in the uh, Roman Empire and uh, lots of folks known and unknown. Uh, who gave up their lives for Christ and for the truth of the gospel. Um, one of the interesting things, if you go to, if I'm remembering correctly, um, I believe it was the, the uh, Church of the Nativity in the, the Holy Land. There is a wall, a stone wall, and it has a opening in it, a circle. You can look right through it. And the reason why that wall is there is because when people were baptized in the early days, they were baptized without any clothing on. And so it's the whole idea that you are becoming a new creation in Christ, in God. Well, pretty quickly, the church realized that it's a little awkward to have the bishop, the elder who is baptizing, and be a man and a woman who is now unclothed going into the water. So what developed was um, a diaconate for women, a women's diaconate, but it was only um, for baptism. So it's different from the diaconate that we know today. Anyway, uh, what happened was that minister would be the one to unclothe the woman and then be the one to lead her into the water and then be the one that would pour the water over her while the bishop was on the other side of the wall saying the prayers. And then when it was time for anointing, he would put his hand through the hole in the wall to anoint. So that's how they, you know, decided to deal with a very thorny question, you know, a difficult question. Um, in time, what will happen is, uh, which is a better, uh, response to all this, um, people will still wear clothing when they go into the water, which is what happens uh, today, of course. So uh, remember again, it's in living water that this is done, but any water will do if you have to. Remember that the first response um, to baptizing would be in a large area of water, running water, like the River Jordan, right? But if you pour water three times, that is acceptable to the church, which then for the Catholic Church becomes normative. Okay, because we don't have a lot of running water, maybe the Santa Ana River, I guess, I guess we could do that when it when it's running. Um, but you know, all our churches, we have baptismal fonts. Okay, yeah. Question. Like the um, other things were being set up in the early church, or baptism into the church, how did that differ from, say, how John the Baptist? Was there a train, anything about a transition, or were there flooding heads of that? Well, you remember that. Um, yes, please repeat the question. Thank you, Father. The question is, uh, what about John the Baptist and his baptism? Is that similar or different from um, the baptism that we're in now? The baptism of John the Baptist actually is something that is akin to Jewish tradition already. He didn't do something radically new. There was um, already a ritual for, with water, um, praying for atonement. The, the very um, normative way or the usual way that we know that atonement happened in the Jewish tradition was to take a goat and then to tie to the goat the sins of the people once a year and to let the goat go out of the city. It would go into the desert and it would die out there with the sins of the people. 
Okay, and that was an early form of atonement. Interesting that um, in Mexico, what is today Mexico, but when the um, uh, the Spanish went into um, Tenochtitlan, uh, which is now Mexico City, um, there was already a, a sense of or a, a kind of um, type of confession that was being used already by the pagan community. So there is this, maybe it runs in our own blood somewhere that we, we realize we need to atone for our uh, errors and our sins, that no matter what religion. But John the Baptist, his was, um, could not give the life-giving grace of regeneration and renewal that the baptism of Christ gave. Uh, baptism by the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What it was, was an intention to turn away from sin, okay? But the, the baptism of Jesus Christ, the baptism that we understand and know, you are made new, you are a new creation. You are radically different spiritually, supernaturally than you were before baptism. All the graces that are given to you, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit are given to you through confirmation, correct? But those gifts cannot be activated successfully until you are leading a, vir a virtuous life. If you're leading the virtues, if you, if you are becoming better and better virtuous, uh, more and more happens. The grace of God really plays out in your life. If you have someone who was really caught up in, in terror, then, then um, that stunts, it keeps the, um, the ability of grace to really flourish in you, okay? So for the gifts of the Holy Spirit to be activated really and to um, uh, work and flourish in you, uh, there needs to be on the first level that we are living virtue. We are living a virtuous life as human beings, not perfectly, because that probably is impossible, but that we, our intention is to, we are struggling with ourselves, we are always working with that. And, and thank God we have this document of penance confession, because that helps to restore the intention to atone and to restore us to grace. Now be careful, because with the sacrament of of confession, it should be received frequently, but not too frequently, right? So if someone is coming less than a week to confession, I will usually, there are two ways to, to approach it. The first is maybe the person is caught up in a very, very difficult sin and their spiritual director has instructed them that as soon as they fall, they are to go to confession. So there is a plan. Okay, but if that is, does not exist, then um, I will usually um, ask the person, you know, uh, just to struggle, to struggle with the sacrament of confession. In other words, it's a sacrament. It should have a longer lasting uh, impact and effect on you. And if it isn't, why? That's the question. It's not the fault of the sacrament or of Jesus Christ, but somehow the person receiving it has still not truly decided, made a decision against the sin, do you see? So you have to renounce the sin, you have to reject it, and you have to rebuke it. Okay. And in that way, um, you um, uh, open the doors again to grace. So it's not a game and it's not magic. Um, it's, it's real relationship building with God, the human person, the human being with God. Okay, so slide two, please. There's our baby again. Okay, and the wonder, look at, look at his eyes. So, um, and this is part of the greatness of the sacrament of baptism. It really illuminates. It gives us a new way of looking at life. Now, uh, when we talked about fasting, um, the Didache, you remember if you read it, it notes that 
the hypocrites fast, and you shall not fast on the days of the hypocrites. You will show, you shall fast on other days. And guess who the hypocrites are? The Pharisees. Okay. And so their custom was to fast on Mondays and Thursdays. This is a custom in Judaism at the time. So what happens with the new community, with the church, is they decide we shall fast on Wednesdays and Fridays. Okay, so they they do appreciate the the custom, but they don't want to do it on the same day as the Pharisees. Remember, I told you that golden rule: read between the lines. So, what does that say? What's going on? Yeah, separation is happening. What else? A terrific tension, right? <laughs> terrific tension because the new community is saying that the Pharisees are hypocrites and naming it in a authoritative document. So there is terrific tension going on. And we know that in the early church, in her history, in the Acts of the Apostles, you have the martyrdom of what saint? The first martyr of the church. Saint Stephen. Saint Stephen. Very good. And St. Stephen represents, really, we can say right now, he represents that whole group of people that's caught in this theological argument. So that Judaism sees that there's this sect, there's something going on, there's something growing out of us that is wrong, and we have to contain it, and we have to get rid of it, okay? And so for that reason, begins a persecution of the early Christian church, uh, stony and so forth, uh, of those that are caught uh, being followers of Christ. Okay, uh, slide please. Okay, so here we go. So the hypocrites, there you go, fast on Mondays and Thursdays. Early Christians will fast on Wednesdays and Fridays tension with the Jewish leadership. Now, as we go on with um, uh, this piece on baptism, uh, I want to read something from St. Justin Martyr. And St. Justin Martyr is a second century uh, saint and a martyr. That's what it's called, murder. But a fantastic uh, writer, wrote a lot of things, and if you look him up, if you really want to dive into uh, what was happening at the time, Justin Martyr is a wonderful saint to read, his apolo Apologia. And he says that the candidate for baptism is to be instructed to pray and to entreat God with fasting for the remission of their sins that are past. We praying and fasting with them. That's a direct quote from him. So what's happening is um, that atonement that already is in the mind and hearts of people because of John the Baptist. And um, the community, which now surrounds the person who is going to be baptized. So it's not, a again, it's not a private experience. It's a communal experience. Baptism always happens within a community. And so whether that is on a, a Saturday when we have the family and friends present for a baby, or it happens at Easter Vigil, which is the crowning event of um, the, you know, the uh, Mass of the Resurrection, or if it happens on a Sunday, the church also says that from time to time, baptisms should you know, with babies usually, should happen on Sunday okay? so that the full community is reminded and experiences again the joy of baptism. You know, there's some folks in the community that they um, they don't have extended family anymore and they don't see this part of Christian life anymore. Um, so it's a, it's a wonderful reminder of that they belong to a bigger family 
And in that bigger family, they share the joy too of this baby, even though they don't know that family personally. But in the family of the church, they belong. See, you know, you notice, isn't it a wonderful thing? And it's still, it was a lot easier when everything was in Latin for this. It's a little bit trickier now, but isn't it true? Wherever you go in the world and you go to mass, it's mass, okay? And you feel comfortable and you should feel comfortable. You see the father, he's your priest and sister, she's your sister and you call her sister. And it's, it's almost a kind of an immediate relational thing, which is really interesting and really beautiful. I remember um, the Archbishop of San Francisco many years ago, not the present one, um, gave a priest retreat to the priest of the Diocese of Orange and his whole pre uh, retreat was on um, the title Father. And by the end of it, what he was leading us to was he was saying, don't give that up. You should not be called by your first name. You're called Father. And the reason why is because it's relational. And you represent as the priest, actually, God the Father in his goodness, his gentleness, his mercy, his desire to save and so forth, okay? And you um, celebrate the sacraments. In other words, you bring the Son of God to the people. Okay? And through those sacraments, the institution and so forth by the Holy Spirit. But uh, it was a wonderful retreat because he was saying, especially in the world today, which becomes cold, this is years ago too, he said the, um, the temptation is to move away from relationship. And we see that when, you know, like for instance, kids are, are on, you know, their, their phones all the time uh, playing the games or, but there's not really a relationship happening. There's, there's other buddies that are, you know, tied into the game and everything, but it's not a face-to-face -face kind of event. And um, we're finding that they're statistically, they're saying that a lot of growth gets stunted because there isn't the play, playing with each other and being out there playing football and throwing the ball and you know all those things that really make a difference. They help to form and shape us. We, we move and get to know each other. So um, the relational piece is very, very, very important. Okay, so Justin goes on. Then they are brought by us where there is water and are regenerated. That's an important word, regenerated in the same manner in which we ourselves were regenerated. For in the name of God, the Father, and the Lord of the universe, and of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and of the Holy Spirit, they then received the washing with water. Okay, so regeneration or regenerate, uh, maybe another way of looking at that is being born again. Okay, becoming a new creation in Christ. So when you are baptized, you cannot repeat that sacrament. It is so solemn and magnificent a moment that Christ claims you for himself. It cannot be um, repeated. Okay, cannot be repeated. Now, when I was um, in my early days at St. Cecilia's, when I was pastor over there, and there was uh, time to do it and so forth, we would have on the Feast of the Baptism, and it was a smaller congregation, everybody would come up and we had lots of towels and they would put their head over and we would pour all the water over them, not baptizing them again, but renewing the baptismal commitment. Okay, everybody, babies, children, elderly, everybody did it. Took a little while to tell you, but it was very profound, you know, so, um, the point being that we can renew the, 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 the promise of baptism and the baptismal experience. We can renew it, but we cannot repeat it, right? Yeah. So if you baptize a uh, non-Catholic Christian. Yes. Uh, the baptism is valid, but you decide to become a Catholic. Yes, thank you. The question is, then you can, you, um, if you're a non-Catholic Christian, are you baptized again or not? No, you're not. As long as that church follows the formula, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, pouring water three times. 
Um, as long as that church follows that formula, um, then we accept that baptism. So it's a beautiful thing that when you're working with the Protestant churches, the Orthodox churches, um, the, the intent of, well, the, the sacrament of baptism unites us, doesn't divide us. Whereas Holy Communion, that's different, you know, or Holy Orders, that's different. But, um, but certainly for, for baptism, it's a unifier. Now, keep in mind too, like we talked about with Dr. Schuler, right? Is the, you have to keep to the formula, otherwise a baptism doesn't happen. And if, let's say, let's say we found out that someone was baptized during that small window of time when Dr. Schuler did that with rose petals, then um, we would baptize, not rebaptize. So you have to use good language here. We would baptize for the first time, okay? Because he did not follow the formula, okay? Yes. Which of the uh, amongst the Christian uh, sect, I mean, different, um, I would call it, they call this and stuff like that. Which of those does not follow the formula? Which of the Protestant churches don't follow the formula? All the classical Protestant churches do follow the formula. Lutheran, Presbyterian, Methodist, and so forth. They do follow the formula. But sometimes an individual minister won't. Um, they have a better idea or something like that. Now, this happened a little bit in our Catholic Church. Remember when there was a little bit of a, a, a kind of a little crisis, tiny crisis, where we found out that there was a priest or a deacon or somebody who had not baptized using the correct formula. Instead of saying, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he said, we baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And just that change of I to we invalidated the sacrament. And those people had to be baptized for the first time because that early baptism did not take effect. And the reason why, because the priest is representing in him through holy orders, Jesus Christ. And it is Jesus Christ in the sacrament who is giving you new life. And it is not the rest of the world with the priest. Okay. Anyway, okay. So um, if we look here, I put the classical, we, I could have chosen any Protestant church, but it's good to, to start with Lutheran because Martin Luther started uh, experiment uh, of Protestantism, which has happened. Uh, back in the early days. Classical Lutheran understanding, man can be saved by faith alone. That's all he needs. Don't need good works, don't need anything. However, that word alone appears nowhere in the Holy Scripture. What does appear in Holy Scripture is that man, woman, can be saved and is saved by faith. So we all agree with that. But that one word alone isn't anywhere in Holy Scripture. And that is our uh, disagreement with the Protestant Church about specifically how we approach baptism. The Orthodox, Oriental Orthodox, would also be in agreement with us on that. Our faith in Christ makes his merits our possession, envelops us in the garb of righteousness, which our guilt and sinfulness hide and supplies in abundance every defect of human righteousness. That's a direct quote from Martin Luther. That's why I put that there. So what's happening is Christ, who is the supreme good, the son of God, covers us, folds us into himself so that when the father is upon us, he is pleased because he sees his son. And he no longer sees sin and ugliness. He sees the beauty of his son, and it pleases the Father. Okay? Catholic and Orthodox understanding is very different. It's not a covering. It's not a shielding. It is a regeneration from the inside out. So what happens is you are uh, made a new creation in the other explanation you are still the same creation, but now you are given the benefit of um, 
the grace and holiness and goodness of the Son of God, which is total. But in Catholic understanding, um, what happens is Christ, you become a new Christ. Christ is in you now. And that regeneration creates in you a new life. Okay? And you are pleasing to the Father, not because he sees the Son of God around you or shielding you, but the Son of God is in you. You are becoming under Christ. And that is what pleases God. See? In spite of your, your sins, in spite of your frailty and so forth, but, but the regeneration of the human soul and person is happening. Now, we had a question back here. Still a question? No. Okay. I had a discussion with the folks that say um, if they've accepted Christ, yes. you don't have to be baptized. Yes. Well, we have some folks that have said um, that uh, we have accepted Christ, but you don't have to be baptized. But you do have to be baptized. So that would be our stance, is because in Holy Scripture says you should not enter the kingdom of heaven unless you be baptized, right? You cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And so, for instance, I have um, in my family a wonderful, wonderful girl who married into our family. She's Protestant. Her family left the church, Catholic church, many, many, many years ago. Her mom became a pastor. And so, uh, anyway, she married into our Catholic family, the very, very strong and devoted family. And the marriage is, you know, it's worked. Um, they got married outside of the church, which was a pain for all of us. And we prayed and prayed and we, we accepted her with love, and she is a good girl. And in time, um, she said, you know what? Uh, let's have the marriage blessed, you know, in the church. That's okay. I, I will accept that. And so I did a um, very simple renewal of vows and blessing in front of the tabernacle for her. And that was a, now that's a Catholic uh, blessing and marriage. And now he can receive Holy Communion again. Okay, well, she had a son, she has a son, wonderful kid, but he's never been baptized because that's not their, um, their belief okay, in the church that she belongs to, Protestant church. And so I, I sat down with them just recently and I said, you know what, I'm really nervous about all of this because your son, God forbid in heaven that anything happened to him. But if there was an accident or something happens, what happens to his soul? Because of that scripture that says you must be baptized in, in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. And so I, I told her, you've got to do something about this because he's already a teen. And we talked about it with him too and agreed, yes, uh, you know, we will baptize. And so, um, you know, because she's Protestant and and uh, he's from uh, a previous union. Um, I said, look, I know you go to church, Protestant church. If you want to baptize in the Protestant church, baptize. Or if you want us to baptize, we will baptize. But you have to come up, you have to discuss that as a family and decide. But if you baptize in the Protestant church, that is received by us as, as true and binding. And so um, it looks like um, that everybody is ready to, to have him go through the Catholic uh, Church. And of course, we have to sit down and talk about, okay, what does that mean? You don't just baptize, but you're being brought into uh, a faith also in a family. And so some bigger conversations that need to happen, but it's really good. It's very, you know, exciting for, for all of us anyway. So sometimes, you know, in the family, and it may not even just, just be religion, but uh, sometimes there's something that happens, your son or daughter um, uh, make a, a life decision that you don't agree with and, and you know is, is not uh, in context with the um, Holy Gospel. Uh, it may be a long stretch. You have to pray and you have to give good modeling and conversation, information and so forth. But if you're nagging, if you're yelling and screaming, if you're using, you know, what we call in Spanish, malas caras, you know, bad faces, you know, um, that, that doesn't win a convert, see? 
because uh, sometimes what will happen instead is they may know they're wrong, but just because you are approaching it that way, they, they will not give in, right? So you may have the right content, but you're packaging it all wrong, okay? Packaging, this is really important as parents and grandparents, believe me. Think about the disagreements maybe you have with children or grandchildren and look at how you're packaging. Well, first of all, make sure you're in the right. <laughs> but if you are in the right, make sure you're packaging this correctly, okay? Otherwise, it ain't gonna happen. Uh, okay. Okay. And, and, we, and there are good, good examples like a service and all that, of all those things. That's their way to heaven. Right. What about people that accept Jesus Christ and they have a different path, a different way than, than the Catholic or Orthodox, the ancient churches? Um, I'm not saying at all that people that don't follow what we do, uh, the ancient churches, uh, that they're going to hell. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying that we keep to the tradition of the apostles. And um, there is something very important about that as well. You know, the question has come up, well, are all Lutherans excommunicated because of what happened, you know, in the uh, 1500s and so forth? And the church says, no, um, leadership uh, during these movements uh, sometimes, uh, well, has to take responsibility for the, the schism and the breaks that they made. But the people that come afterwards, um, that's not part of that responsibility, okay? So, or you might think of it, um, are all Jews, uh, what we used to, we hear sometimes Christ killers, a terrible thing to say, no. You know, and Pope Benedict was very clear about this, that um, the, the leadership at the time, Jewish and Roman, and others are responsible for the death of Christ, but not the whole Jewish nation. In fact, Pope Benedict wrote a really extraordinary reflection on, remember that um, during the Passion, when um, Christ is brought before Pilate, and then the people yell out, may his blood be upon us. Remember that? Which is kind of a frightening thing. May his blood be upon us. You know, we take responsibility for this. And Pope Benedict writes that, isn't it a, a, an interesting thing that when Catholics refer to the blood of Christ, it is always mercy and it is life-giving, it is not a curse. And so he says, in a strange way, were the people calling upon themselves not knowing the blood of Christ, but not as a curse, but that in fact, um, that somehow in God's read, um, it cannot be a curse, you know, so that somehow the blood of Christ uh, is a grace. Um, that all so these are the mystic, mysterious things that come together at the end of the world. You know, why did this happen? Or how, what, how does that fit? Or so forth. And so Pope Benedict is saying, we do not accept that that was a curse laid for the entire Jewish world until the end of time. Um, and even in the, the, the most dramatic sense, calling upon yourself the blood of Christ, we say, that's mercy. For us, that's mercy, that's love, that's grace. And you can't change that. Nobody can change that. Nobody can make the blood of Christ a curse. See, Pope Benedict, beautiful, beautiful. One of the great theologians, right, of our time, and maybe even... Um, in the history of the church. The Orthodox leaders that I would meet with um, when I was working for USCCB would often say, we can't argue with him. The theologians would say, we can't argue with him because he knows us and he knows our history and he knows theology. We can't argue with Benedict. And they said, he is the, 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 uh, the finest theologian that the Catholic church has had in a long time. 
And that's a great compliment for the Orthodox. Okay. So um, uh, we get, do you kind of get the difference that's going on here between classical Protestantism and the Catholic stance? It's very important. So, and I say classic, I always use this word classical Protestantism because I'm referring to what Martin Luther said. But Lutherans today are all over the place. There are a lot of Lutherans that hold to what Martin Luther said, and there's a lot that have gone way beyond him. Um, one of the discussions that we had in the dialogue with the Lutherans was the question came up, uh, does God change? Is there anything about God that doesn't change? That was the question. And the experts on the Catholic side posted that question to the experts on the Lutheran side. And the Lutheran experts, who are wonderful people, lovely, where I mean, we're all friends, you know, in the midst of all this stuff. They gather together and they're talking and they're going on, and then they come back. There is uh, God changes all the time, and there's nothing constant about him. And so the Catholic side said, that's uh, astonishing to us, because even Martin Luther wouldn't hold that. And, um, and the Catholic, Catholic uh, side said, if God changes constantly, if his truth changes constantly, then what is truth finally? Because for the Catholic and Orthodox mind, truth is eternal. It cannot be voted on. It cannot be compromised. It simply is. Okay. And we have to conform ourselves to truth. We conform ourselves to truth. Truth does not conform to us. You see the difference? It's very essential. Okay. All right. Uh, slide four, please. Okay, the Our Father. This was kind of a nice reminder to me, too, that the early Christian community was very uh, intentional about praying the Our Father three times a day. And you may think, oh, I, I pray the Our Father about 20 times, you know, a day, because in the car and when I'm, you know, and I guess we do, but, um, but it was very intentional that this very sacred prayer be prayed slowly, intentionally, reflectively, three times a day. We have to be careful, everyone has to be careful about form prayer. Form prayer are prayers like the Our Father, the Hail Mary, the Glory Be, the Creed, and so forth. They're beautiful prayers because they say everything correctly, correct theology. The Our Father is the only prayer given to us by Jesus Christ, the only prayer taught by him. Okay? So it has pride of place in our spiritual walk and especially in the Mass. Every Mass has the Our Father because it's the prayer that He gave us. All right. But we can, for instance, with the Rosary and Hail Marys, go so quickly through the Hail Marys that, you know, they don't float up to heaven, they fall like stones. Right? So there has to be. Uh, a, an understanding of what I'm doing and what I need when I pray something like the rosary. Okay. And um, I think it was um, St. John Utes who says that, uh, or uh, who is the great uh, Marian saint? That you go through Mary to come to Jesus. Benedict. Not Benedict. De Montfort, thank you. Oh my gosh. Oh, guys are <laughs> yeah, De Montfort, he says that um, every Hail Mary is like a rose that you place before um, the Virgin, like you would give a rose to your mother. It's a it, it's a rose, a spiritual rose that you offer to her. OK, well, if you're just rattling it off, what are you offering? You know, maybe a dead thing or I don't know. It's, a, you know, it's not too pleasing. So. It's important that we remember that we have to care for our spiritual lives. It's not how many rosaries I get in in one day, but actually it is the rosary said with the intention of the church 
is a beautiful meditation. The Hail Marys become almost a mantra. That's not scary. That just simply means that what happens is you're put into a contemplative uh, environment, contemplative environment, and then the mystery, the joyful, the luminous, the glorious, whatever mystery you're thinking, um, the resurrection from the dead, that's what your, your, your meditation, your mind is going through. And the Hail Marys are keeping you in that contemplative place, you see? Okay. So um, there needs to be real reflection with it. Yeah, George. Uh, Father, what's the difference between the Our Father in the Old Testament and the Our Father in the New Testament? I do believe there's a difference in wording. Um, in the, the Our Father is not in the Old Testament. It's only in the New Testament, but there are a couple of different translations of it depending on the gospel writer. And the biggest difference may be um, probably is the doxology at the end. Um, for thine is the, the kingdom, the glory. Okay. Um, that in some translations that's connected to the Our Father and others it isn't. In the Catholic ritual or in mass, the Our Father is there and then the doxology comes after it. So it is connected, but not quite. So um, there's not one translation, I think, that is, you know, uh, in error or anything like that. It's simply that for liturgy, for the, the worship, um, the church realizing that she had a couple of translations, she chose one. Yeah, Tom. I, I thought about a year ago, there was some discussion out of Rome about maybe a improvement on the translation, something about the lead us out in temptation part or something like that. Do I misremember? No, you, you remember correctly. There was um, some in Italy, the Our Father has changed slightly. And the wording has, has changed slightly. Uh, in the United States, the bishops of the United States looked at that very quickly and said, no, we will not change it, but we will keep to the translation that we have. Because one of the things, too, is remember, the translation we use is used by most of the Protestant churches. And because of that, you don't want to change something that uh, creates more division amongst the, in the Christian family when there's really no need for it. There was a time I remember, I think it was when uh, early on when I was a priest, the bishops of the United States looked at the possibility of changing the Hail Mary. And the idea was to remove the old English, blessed art thou among women, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, you know, and, and then instead going to your womb and so forth. And there was such an outcry that the bishops backed off and they said, okay, we'll leave it alone. You know, so um, and I'm glad they did, because even though it's old English, it's uh, it's quite lovely and it's part of our, you know, our history and our tradition. OK, so three times a day. Now, what happens, what develops, though, is that there are certain points in the day when the Christian community will call itself to prayer, much like Islam does today. OK. Early Christianity did this. So what has finally gelled over the centuries and is prayed in monasteries, convents, um, diocesan priests, priests, religious priests, we all take a promise to pray the breviary. That's that collection of all these prayers and more. Um, we take a promise to do that every day. Um, now, there are men and women, religious and lay members of the church that also pray these hours, um, the breviary or the liturgy of the hours, but it's not under a promise. It's simply out of the goodness of their heart, and they want to increase their, their relationship, their touch with, with God. So usually around 6 a.m., it can be maybe 5. I mean, I wake up at lately at 4.30 in the morning, I'm not sure why, just wide awake. And so um, it's easy to, to start off with my prayers that usually I'll do maybe around six. But the, the point is the beginning of your day early, early, 
you begin with the Office of Readings. And the Office of Readings are three Psalms and then a long reading from the Old Testament. And then another reading, usually from a saint. I wish, I wish all of you would read and make that a part of your daily life because for me, it, it's one of the more beautiful parts of the bravery of the Liturgy of the Hours because you're constantly learning and reinforcing um, the, the teaching of Christ in you. So you've got the Old Testament or New Testament, which is great. Okay. And then you have the second reading, which is from a reflection of a saint. And they're spectacular. You get St. Augustine and St. Uh, Francis and Francis Xavier and um, Paul Miki, the martyr, and they have his last words. He's, he's being put on the cross to be crucified. Uh, we have the very words of Bernadette and, and what her experience was of when she saw the Lady of Lourdes. And so it's, it's a constant um, renewal, I think, of Catholic faith. And um, I wish there was a way, and there must be a way that we can uh, generate that in the bigger community. But anyway, that's for another day. Then around at least by 9 a.m., you have morning prayer. You've got three more Psalms again. You have a very short reading that it really is the heart of that hour. Kind of is supposed to inspire you for the day. And then you have um, the prayer of Zachariah that comes from... Uh, you know, uh, his prayer of joy, we say every day. And then you have intercessions. And the intercessions just are all over the place. Now, remember that intercessions in the Catholic Church are never just for Catholics, even at Mass. We pray for the needs of the whole world because we are um, convinced that we must have a, let's call it a holy anxiety for the world for ourselves, but also for the world. We want everyone to go to heaven. That's the point. We don't want any soul to be lost. And the truth is that when a soul is lost, we must consider that for God must be uh, an extreme, you know, uh, unfulfillment of his own desire and his will. He wills that all people be saved. And for a soul to go to hell, it's, it must be like losing a universe because God created that eternal soul to be with him in love. And now it lives in, in desperation forever. Okay. So um, then we conclude the morning prayer. And then here we are at daytime prayer, which is a very, very brief prayer. Again, um, Psalms and then um, uh, a closing prayer. Very, very brief. And then evening prayer is like morning prayer, um, the mirror image of it. Three Psalms, a reading, but now we have the uh, Magnificat. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. We say that. Then we go into intercessions again, and then we finish with the Our Father. Okay. So the same as morning prayer. And then bedtime, right before bed. Remember, we talked about, uh, and I encouraged you to do the examination of conscience when you're, you're putting your head on your pillow. What went right today? What didn't go right today? Lord, I'm sorry for what didn't go right. I'm going to try harder. And Lord, thank you, thank you. Be praised for all the good that happened today. And help me to be better tomorrow. That's basically the, the, you know, the, the heart of uh, night prayer. Okay? So this has become um, the ordinary way of um, uh, especially vowed uh, uh, in holy orders or, or even uh, religious, especially. So far, so good. All right. So. Um, slide five, please. Question, yes. Is it okay after you said that you listen to the all these prayers because there's an app called the Divine Office and it has beautiful songs and they have um, speakers. Is it valid when I'm just listening to it 
Yeah. Is it valid to, to do these prayers or listen to them on an app when it's being spoken or prayed and you're listening? Yes, it is. In fact, um, sometimes I have an app where the whole um, morning prayer or evening prayer is chanted. Yes. And it's very beautiful. And so sometimes when I'm driving, I'll put that on. Uh, maybe early in the morning, I need to get somewhere. So I do my office and then I put that on and that's what I'm listening to as I'm driving to whatever, wherever, which is about 15 minutes. That's, you know, can be 15 minutes to a half hour, depending on how much reflection time you want to give it. But on the app, it will, it usually is about 15 minutes. And what I find is because for 33 years, I've been praying these um, longer than that, actually 30, about 39 years. Uh, when I was in seminary, uh, what happens is as the chanting is happening, I already know, and I'm yeah, I already remember it. It's already in my memory, so I'm I'm praying along with it. So it's it's pretty good. But even if you're just listening and you're not um, conversant with the psalm or something, um, it still is prayer. Okay. So uh, for instance, when I go to St. Michael's Abbey and uh, I'll go maybe for Vespers or evening prayer um, and it's the, the prayers are being chanted in Latin um, and it's beautiful. And I may not catch everything because I'm not, you know, a superhero in Latin. Um, I, I can celebrate mass in Latin, but, but um, not conversant with the language where I can talk to you like this. Some of our fathers can. Um, but it's beautiful, and so I, I listen and I take the grace that I can in that the Word of God is being lifted up and chanted, and I'm reverencing the Word of God, okay? All right, so that's all we're going to say about baptism. There's an awful lot more to say about it, but I'm just sticking to the document and what the document is presenting to us, okay? So the takeaway on baptism, guess what? From the early time, it's already an authoritative document. So no one can say that baptism evolved later. Now, what we're going to see in the Holy Eucharist is the same thing. There is a development that happens in all the sacraments. So the way I pray the sacrament of, um, uh, of uh, matrimony, you know, the, the marriage vows, will sound different than maybe 200 years ago or 500 years ago. The essentials are always there, but Old English, um, much more flowery maybe, um, and so forth and, and so on. But what's important is that the formula uh, remains intact, okay? Remember, formulas are essential. All right, now, I love this picture of the Last Supper. I'm not a real big fan of the Da Vinci one, maybe because we've seen it too many times, I don't know. But the reason why I like this is it's it's not really the way it happened. <laughs> okay, so our Lord is holding up a beautiful host, you know, and saying, take this, all of you, and eat of it. And you see the, all the, the apostles just in wonder of it. Okay, um, he used bread, you know, a loaf and so forth. But... The reason why I love this is because it's catechetical, and this is pure Catholicism of trying to teach, you know, catechizing. And so um, making the connection between that night, that blessed night of the Last Supper, and what we do every day with the Mass, and reminding us that this is what was happening today. The way we celebrate is a direct connection and uh, binding to the first event, right? Okay, so the Holy Eucharist. The um, chapters that we have, uh, 9 and 10 in the Didache, are Eucharistic prayers, primitive Eucharistic prayers. In the West, we recall that the that long prayer of the priest where consecration happens, that's called the canon. It's like a you know, shooting a cannon. In the east, it's called anaphora. The different word you use, anaphora. But we use canon. 
in early times, actually, this was the heart of the whole mass. We can say it is today too, but there's a lot more that surrounds the moment of consecration and then reception of Holy Communion, you know, the readings and so forth. But really, um, in the beginning, there was a lot of fluidity as to um, what was said during um, the Mass. So I want to read to you again my big saint tonight, Justin Martyr. Um, he wrote this at about 153 AD. He died at 165 AD. Okay, that's just to give you a little bit of perspective. St. John died around 100 AD. So he's pretty contemporary. Okay? And this is what he writes. I just want you to listen. But we, after we have thus washed him who has been convinced and has assented to our teaching. Okay, you're talking wash, that's baptism. But we, after we have thus washed him, who has been convinced and has assented to our teaching, bring him to the place where those who are called brethren are assembled. In order that we may offer hearty prayers in common for ourselves and for the baptized, illuminated person. See? Illumination happens through baptism. You have a new vision, new understanding of who you are, of life, of where you're going, of God. That we may be counted worthy now that we have learned the truth by our works also to be found good citizens and keepers of the commandments so that we may be saved with an everlasting salvation. So belonging to the faith is supposed to make you a better person. And a good citizen. Not stealing. You know, not uh, undermining uh, the government and so forth. And this is why, uh, again, John Paul would often say the Catholic Church can live under any form of government, even communism, as long as the Catholic Church has the right to uh, worship and uh, to, to uh, approach God the way she does. Reminding governments and presidents and kings they have no right to not uh, give that. Um, theirs is, um, their uh, authority is given by God. God is the one that grants authority in this world to anything and anyone. And so um, yeah, a, a president cannot decree something or a, or a king cannot decree something against the gospel as truth because he is not higher than the gospel. And this is why for us, it's very important that whatever political uh, communities or, or groups that we belong to, um, we always have to, again, put on the lens of the gospel and of Jesus Christ when we're looking at our political parties and what they represent and teach. You will never be happy completely. Okay because um, this is the, the way of the world. There's no political party that ever, ever uh, follows exactly authentically the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, hasn't it yet. They get close sometimes, but they haven't yet. And so you have to make sure that you don't get swept along into something that finally really isn't what Christ preached. All right. Having ended the prayers, we salute one another with a kiss. Now that's the kiss of peace, right? It happened at a different place, not after, you know, not when we have it, but in, uh, in the early church, it happened a lot earlier in what we call the mass. There is then brought to the president of the brethren bread and a cup of wine mixed with water. Uh -huh. We still do that. The Orthodox still do that too. So there is a little bit of water. Remember, you see that the little bit of water drop is placed into the chalice of wine. You notice that? And what does, does anybody know what that means? Why we do that? Humanity. 
Okay, so everything in the mass, many things in the mass are symbolic and we need to remember what things mean. So um, you're all on the right track. So when that drop of water, that drop of water represents humanity. The sweet wine represents divinity, represents God. The drop of water, humanity, falls into the wine and disappears. So when you, if you were to look into the chalice of wine, you would not see the water. It's gone. And the whole symbol of it, beautiful symbol of it, is that um, in the Mass, what happens is we become Christ. We are becoming Christ. And uh, we lose our ego, our selfish identities, to become the truth of who we are, which is another Christ baptism. See? So it's a very beautiful thing. We dissolve into divinity. And that is the goal and what awaits you after death. Because with salvation comes divinization. We call that um, uh, holiness, sanctity. In the East, it's called divinization. I like that word better because it's more um, shocking and dramatic. You become divinized. You become divine at the end when you're saved. You shall be like unto gods. That's holy scripture. You shall be like other, you know, unto gods. Not God. But you shall be like unto God. That's a pretty gutsy thing that the gospel and the New Testament promises. Okay. So it means in that you are elevated to a, a relationship with God, but also a um, interior completion that uh, is not understood or known in this world. But you become no longer slaves, not even a nice slave who's taken care of by a good master. But you become a brother and sister to Christ Jesus. I no longer call you slave. I call you now friend. Right? You're adopted. Baptism adopts you into the family of God. Christ can claim to be a true son of the father. But we are all adopted, brought to the family of God by his love and grace and mercy of Jesus. Okay, let's take a break for 10 minutes and we'll come back. I want to pull this together by 8.30, so let's get back now. All right. So once again, there is then brought to the president of the brethren. President is the word that they use for bishop at that time. Presider, president. And a cup of wine mixed with water. And he taking them gives praise and glory to the father of the universe. Through the same of the son and of the Holy Ghost. And offers... Thanks at a considerable length. I had to laugh at that for our being counted worthy to receive these things at his hands, a considerable length. Um, so you're saying, you know, I don't know if that was tongue in cheek or something, but anyway, long. And the Eucharist prayer is a long prayer, right? There is another document that talks about how the presider um, will will give the homily. He will talk um, for uh, a long, a long time. So they were giving long homilies. But remember that back in the day, even in the time of St. Anthony of Padua, St. Francis, St. Anthony was known for giving uh, 
homily said we're an hour and a half, two hours long. <laughs> Don't get mad at us. <laughs> All right. Okay, and when he has concluded the prayers and thanksgivings, all the people present express their assent by saying, Amen. This word, Amen, answers in the Hebrew language to so be it. Okay, this is still St. Justin. So when you come up for Holy Communion and the priestess or the uh, EM says, uh, Body of Christ, you say, I don't say we are, don't say, isn't it wonderful? Don't, you know, sometimes people make up their own, you know, or some people say nothing at all. And when they do that, I say amen, because um, this is a this is a, a very key moment. So when you say amen, Pope Benedict reminds us that that amen is not only that you believe that the bread in front of you is the very person of Jesus Christ in a very supernatural and mysterious way, but you believe the whole content of Catholic faith. So this is why Pope Benedict said other Christians cannot receive Holy Communion from the Catholic Church because they don't believe in purgatory. They don't believe in the uh, immaculate conception and the assumption and so forth. So when you're saying amen, you're not saying amen just to that this is the body of Christ, but at Holy Communion time, you are reaffirming your entire Catholic faith. It's an amazing uh, thing to me that this is a moment of absolute reaffirmation in the whole content of what you believe as a Catholic Christian. And when the president has given thanks and all the people have expressed their assent, those who are called by us deacons, oh, we got deacons. Well, we have that in the New Testament, but here it is again. Give to each of those present to partake of the bread and wine mixed with water over which the thanksgiving was pronounced. And to those who are absent, they carry away a portion. Okay, we still do that. And so, but here um, at this time, it was the deacon who was giving out uh, the Holy Eucharist. Now it's uh, the ordinary minister, it's the priest himself, but the deacon, if he is present, he also gives out Holy Communion. And, um, and then carrying away a portion, why? Well, because in the early church, remember that story we all grew up with of St. Tarsus, and it was that young, um, young adult, and he was part of that group that they would be given a portion of the Eucharist placed in what we'll call a pix, a little container. And then they would run out of church and they would run to different parts of the city where other Christians were gathered waiting for that little piece. They already had Eucharist that was consecrated, but they're waiting for this little piece from the bishop. And then that was placed with all the rest of the Eucharist, and it was the way that the early church said, we are one church, okay? Now that, of course, is not possible. It, logistically, you just can't do that. Plus, you know, like at uh, Blessed Sacrament, where I was at, they had, um, how many, I think, 12 masses on a weekend? So you got these poor guys that'd be running to the bishop, you know, running from the <laughs> bishop, you know, constantly, okay. So, but the, but the idea is very, very key and important that um, the church is trying to find a way to um, help for people to understand you are not separate communities. We, we are all united under the lead shepherd, the lead pastor. And it, it's a wonderful thing that Eucharist is taken from our mass to those that are uh, ill or, you know, in the hospital or, or perhaps even near death. And this food, he continues, is called among us a, a, a Eucharistia. Eucharist, Eucharistia, of which no one is allowed to partake, but the man who believes that the things which we teach are true and who has been washed with the washing that is for the remission of sins 
and unto regeneration, there it is, and who is so living as Christ has enjoined. Okay. So uh, you cannot just give out uh, the Eucharist to everybody. Even at this early point in the church, there's a discernment that, that happens. For not as common bread and common drink do we receive these, but in like manner as Jesus Christ our Savior, having been made flesh by the word of God, had both flesh and blood for our salvation. So likewise have we been taught that the food which is blessed by the prayer of his word, and from which our blood and flesh by transmission, transmutation are nourished, is the flesh and blood of Jesus who was made flesh. Right? In other words, this is not a symbol. This is the real thing. I want to remind you, this is 155 AD. St. Justin Marty, and he's not the only one. There are many other writers and saints of this time. They're talking about the reality of what's going on with the bread and wine. Pastor Chan, who is a very, very important evangelical uh, pastor and um, preacher and uh, not just in the United States, but even outside of the, the States, he about uh, a year ago kind of shocked the evangelical world because he's very well respected and well known and well loved. And he said, I have come to believe that what the Catholics hold that the bread and wine become the real body and blood of Jesus Christ. I cannot deny that. That looking back all the way to the church fathers, church fathers are all those people right after the apostles, the leadership after the apostles. We have a lot of their writings. They are already preaching us, writing it, talking about it. So of course it comes from the New Testament, of course, but it's spelled out and developed. Um, as time goes on. Okay, so in the early church, the Eucharistic prayer was fluid. Um, it was as much for the bishop like the homily on the spot. Only circa 535 AD, during Emperor Justinian's reign, was the wording finally fixed. So up until that time, it was up to the local bishop to um, determine what he was going to say during the Eucharistic prayer. And the principal piece that had to be there was the story, let's say, the story of salvation. Giving thanks to God who has created all things, has sent his son to us to save us, and now we receive from him eternal life. Um, Justin Martyr goes on to say, before, now this is before all of this is fixed, it is not altogether necessary for the bishop to recite the very same words which we gave before, as though studying to say them by heart in his thanksgiving to God, but let each one pray according to his own ability. If indeed he is able to pray suitably and with a grand and elevated prayer, this is a good thing. But if, on the other hand, he should pray and recite a prayer according to a brief form, no one shall prevent him. Only let his prayer be correct, let it be orthodox. Okay. But what happens over time, let's read between the lines. What happens over time is uh, Eucharistic prayers are not being prayed in an orthodox way and um, in a correct way. And so finally, the church, whenever the church makes a, a, a regulation or a law with the liturgy, there's a reason for it. It's not because she just, well, what are we going to do? Well, let's see. Uh, this month, let's do this or, you know, but it's really, it's always a response to something. And so to finally put a fixed prayer, which will develop very much until now we have four, right, Eucharistic prayers. And then we have a group of other Eucharistic prayers, which we are permitted to pray and have prayed a couple times here. They used to be called the Swiss Eucharistic prayers. They're really beautiful. They're in the sacrament of the Missal at the end, but they can be prayed um, anytime. Um, and then the Eucharistic prayers of reconciliation, which are very beautiful for Lent. 
But the four main are the ones that you usually you hear. The canon, Eucharistic prayer one, is the longest. Okay. And it involves a lot of gestures that the others don't. Um, the Eucharistic prayer is the briefest, number two, the briefest. And that one is written by Saint Hippolytus from, I think, about the second century. We just celebrated his feast a couple of days ago. And uh, Saint Pontian and Hippolytus, who were actually not friends at all in the beginning, they were opponents to each other. And if I remember right, I think Hippolytus was an anti pope. Uh, he claimed to be pope, but he was not the true pope. Pontian was the true pope. And they were both arrested by the emperor who didn't like either of them <laughs> and thrown on one island. And that's where they reconciled. And, um, and Hippolytus bowed to Pontian as being the, the true Holy Father. And the church, after they were martyred, both were martyred, the church canonized both of them. And so their feast day is together. <laughs> okay. um, so uh, chapter 9 and 10 are portions of Eucharistic prayers, right? And so then we close with that, um, with this document. There is an awful lot more to say about Eucharistic prayers, um, especially what makes the four um, distinct. I like Eucharistic Prayer 3 because there's always a section there where I can put saints in. So um, any saint. And so depending on the readings or the saint of the day um, or the maybe the instruction I gave where I talked about a saint, I will put that saint's name in uh, the Eucharistic prayer. Number four is longer, but it's very beautiful. It's the whole kind of story of creation and uh, with its culmination in Jesus Christ. Very, very beautiful, but it's a longer one. So if we give a homily that's a little too long, we will go to Eucharistic prayer too. <laughs> However, we try very hard because the church wants us to use on Sundays, number one or number three. Weekdays, number two. Okay, Four is used a lot less. Okay. Maybe one day we can um, do a walk through the mass just from beginning to end and what's going on in the mass step by step. And it's really powerful. All the, the the things that we have forgotten. Right? We sign up. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So um, let me stop there because uh, next week we're going to talk about the Antichrist because that features already in this document. Okay. And then uh, if I'm able to keep it at a reasonable time, I want to open it up just to ask you, what's the difference now for you? So after going through the five weeks, what's the difference? You know, what have you learned and how is your faith deeper and so forth? Okay. So um, anyways, we'll close now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Father, again, we thank you and praise you, and this is our custom. Uh, every day we are grateful for life, even for the crosses that come our way. Somehow we see your majesty, your goodness, and your mercy in them. All of this, whatever good, whatever bad, whatever difficult, uh, whatever challenging is shaping us, if we look at it correctly, shaping us for the kingdom of heaven. And Lord, we subdue all the things uh, that are not of you, and we ask that you continue through your life-giving Holy Spirit to embolden us and to uh, give us uh, the grace to say no to darkness. And finally, once again, uh, we place ourselves in the care of the lady who loves us and who uh, prays for us and is our mother in heaven. Hail Mary, full, full of grace, grace the Lord is with thee. Blessed thou art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The Lord be with you. With your spirit. May Almighty God bless and protect you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Good night, everybody.